Okay. My name is Stanley Sword, and I have the great pleasure to sit here with Carol Nilsson, professor in Lund, but she just came from America, from Texas, from Galveston, and you changed your research environment. That's correct. Yeah. What do you think the, the, the differences and the similarities between Sweden and America in, in, in research? Well, Sweden is a, is a great place to be right now. Uh, because you have, for for the medical research that I perform in, in, a, in a larger group, you have good clinical biobanks and you have a lot of clinical data associated with samples. And so these large sample sets will probably allow us to identify new targets for precision medicine and cancer. And uh, I didn't finish my degree, but you took two degrees, both in chemistry and as a doctor. And in America, you have to become, take a first degree before you become a doctor. But uh, you did your chemistry uh, studies in, uh, in the US from the beginning. And your father was a professor in chemistry as well. And he had a keen eye for amber. Yes, he did. A passion did. for amber. <laughs> Tell me about your father. Uh, my dad, who's st still alive, he's 90 years young, um, was just kind of a, a rascally, inquisitive scientist. And so, as my dad, uh, I have sort of the same nature. <laughs> and so he was, he was my best friend almost, you know, growing up. And he was active in research. So when I was quite young, uh, I was able to follow with him to his laboratory I think probably today that's not allowed to have you know four or five year olds in uh, <clears throat> no grass shit here in your chemistry uh -huh. lab, but uh, I would watch what he was doing, and I was simply fascinated by the entire environment and uh, these bands on uh, chromatographic bands that he was uh, going to analyze with NMR nuclear magnetic uh, resonance spectroscopy. Uh, and I, I fell in love with chemistry for that. It seemed just a little bit magical and caught my imagination. And when you were eight, you were already a chemist. Yes, I was. Uh, I, I knew the entire periodic table by heart. I can't say I do now, but uh, <laughs> it was it was so, fun. <laughs> and your father, he. he uh, he studied the difference between amber here in Europe and in the U.S. to try to find the different differences and similarities between them. Yes, yeah, so he, uh, he examined structural uh, differences between amber from Central America and Baltic amber, which you have a lot here in Sweden. It washes mm. up on the southern shores here in southern Sweden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't found it still, but there's many years to come, hopefully. And your mother, she, she worked with the jet fighter simulators. Yes, she worked for the Department of Defense and was, um, you know, one of the early pioneers in developing specific uh, computer programs for, um, yeah, these simulations, yeah. simulation projects, but also looking at large amounts of data on you know, soldiers and all sorts of things. I, I was never, it, it was a Department of Defense, so I didn't know exactly what she was doing. None of us did, but, but she you, was very good at it. <laughs> but you kind of merged these two things, chemistry and computer science, that you use now with mass spec and other tools to, to dig deep into our human body and our human mind and, and, and the human diseases. Yes, so there's a, it's sort of a double-edged sword what I'm doing now because I have my own interest in precision medicine for the treatment of brain tumors, which are just a horribly underserved patient group, mm. and we need to help them. Uh, but also as part of my move to Lund University, I was named director of the Swedish National Infrastructure in Biological Mass Spectrometry. Mm. And this is going to be a huge resources, re resource for Swedish investigators to use our diagnostic and uh, experimental setups to answer their questions. 
So part of what I do is to help all researchers in Sweden with their projects and then to drive my own research as well. And I find that very satisfying. Yeah. And we looked at your tools today. Yes. <clears throat> Boy toys and girl toys <laughs> for, for 100 million Swedish crowns or so. Uh, there was a Nobel Prize in the early 2000s, one American and one Japanese guy. Tell us about your, your tools here. Yes. So the for the uh, Nobel Prize you're referring to, that was 1998. Or, so excuse me, that was 2002. 1998 is oh. when I got my PhD. <laughs> 2002 it was. Uh, and the prize in chemistry went to three people, two of which work in direct context of mass spectrometry, which mm. is you know, my technology. Uh, and that was John Finn, who was given a prize for the development of electrospray ionization, and to Tanaka from Japan for desorption of uh, large molecules using a matrix-assisted method. The third uh, prize winner is Kurt Wutrich, who got a prize in NMR spectroscopy. So we can never have more than three. Uh, <laughs> and those were the winners that yeah. year. So that was a big lift for the mass spectrometry field because these two gentlemen and others, many others were involved, but these are the, we were the prize winners, uh, they were given the prize because suddenly we could analyze small amounts of large molecules. And so if we think of uh, the human being, we're made up of rather large molecules for, for the most part. So we have proteins that are quite large. We have lipids. We have complex sugars. And suddenly we were able to analyze these in very small amounts, so from clinically re relevant amounts of proteins with mass spectrometry, biological mass spectrometry. And the American, he developed a little glass needle covered with metal that yes. shoots between an electromagnetic field there, there between. Uh, tell us about that. We saw that action in live today. Yes, so it's a little bit like um, a hairspray can from the old days. Mm. You, you start the, the voltage on this uh, metal-covered colored needle, and you get suddenly a liquid spray of droplets. And the droplets are heated in the source of our instruments. And they, what, it, what comes out is like popcorn, it's, uh, naked biological ions. And that's what we can analyze in the mass analyzer, mass spectrometer. Hmm. And after your chemistry studies, or during it, you, you found your love, a Swedish man. Yes. Uh, called Nilsson, last yes. name. And therefore you have a Swedish uh, last name. And you moved over to the other side of the world, to Sweden. Mm-hmm. And you started your, your studies in Gothenburg. Yes. At the same time, to become a doctor, at the same time as you had your, your first child and got your second child during the studies. Mm -hmm. How is it to, to, you know, keep all the balls in the air, so to say? You had a hectic time. Well, I understand. You have some children, too. You know exactly how hectic that <laughs> yeah. is. It's that spa day <laughs> here with you. It's so calm and so fantastic day here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no screams at all. <laughs> no, no, that's right. Uh, well, it takes a village, as they say. So, uh, you know, I had wonderful support around me. Uh, not only my husband, but my uh, parents-in-law were absolute angels, and they they came when I needed them because you know the the medical studies are are quite demanding, and there are lots of exams and things like that. So if I had something that I couldn't miss and one of the children was sick, they would come up all the way from Malmo to Gothenburg just to help me out. So um, it takes a village. Yeah. I can't claim that I was a saint. You know, I mean, I had, I had my, the things I had to do that, you know, I couldn't change. And so it's wonderful to have help from family. And you grew up in, in Carmel, just south of San Francisco and south of, of, the, of the, you know, the, the, the really 
an energetic boom society, Silicon Valley. Yes. How is it you grew up in that environment? Well, um, it's quite a dynamic environment there. It's gotten more so. So when I was um, when I was young, Silicon Valley was pretty much orchards, walnut trees, fruit trees, and slowly, with the wonderful discoveries and technology that were made around Stanford and UC Berkeley, UC San Francisco, uh, and the building of these these large technology companies that attract a lot of employees, that's when it changed. Mm -hmm. So it's really been a technology-driven change to the whole geography there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and how come? You know, how, how did that environment, how did it be created in such a beautiful way? Well, I don't think it was a random happening. I think it was the draw of uh, and the creativity of the highly intelligent people that are hired by Stanford and the, the UC system there, uh, and they got to know each other. So Hewlett Packard, those were <coughs> those were two guys at Stanford that yeah. started that company. Yeah, but then you have the dropouts like uh, Steve Jobs. I studied calligraphy, and, 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 but you know, he dropped out. And, and, uh, and you have others these days that are taking the torch and carrying out to the next generation. Mm -hmm. What do you think the future of Silicon Valley will, the next chapter will be? Wow, if I could predict that, um, I would probably be better at uh, placing <laughs> money in the market. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it will continue to grow. And now, now that Google is there, Google is mm. a creativity incubator. And so who knows what comes out, you know, as far as ideas from these very young people that work there and see things differently from, you know, anyone else. That's where you get your new ideas. That's where you get the next generation of um, disruptive technologies or anything like that. It's, it's coming from the younger people who are really bright and some of the older people that are still bright. <laughs> and we've seen that disruptive thing coming to, to computer science and then moving on into, like, with Uber, with the taxi industry, mm -hmm. with, with Airbnb, with the hotel industry, just turning everything upside down. Do you think that could be the same thing coming into um, biotech, your field? Yes. Uh, in fact, we've experienced that in the mass spectrometry field a couple of times. So the very best mass spectrometer, the one that is the most accurate, the one that has the best resolution between uh, telling the difference between different ions, is a Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometer. And from the beginning, all of those required superconducting magnets. And those are large and expensive. They're potentially dangerous. Um, if you get stuck on one with because you have metal on your body, they're very, very strong magnets. And suddenly, and this would have been um, in about the mid 2000s, around 2007, I believe, there was a new mass analyzer invented that didn't require a superconduct conducting magnet, but it was based on ion cyclotron resonance. And not only was it was it safer, um, but it was also less expensive. Mm -hmm. So suddenly we had very, uh, very, very excellent mass spectrometers to a much lower price. And so this allowed the spread of mass spectrometry into labs that could not have handled it before, um, but who have you know, important biological or medical questions that they want to answer, and they need mass spectrometry measurements in order to move their projects forward. So mm. that was a very good uh, thing that happened. And that was the Orbitrap. It was invented by Makarov. Mm. And you did your studies in, in, at Berkeley? Chemistry, yes. Yeah. Tell us, how, how is that environment compared to other universities in America? Well, okay, so if we look at different universities, there's private and there's public. 
So private in, you know, in, the, in that area would have been Stanford. Public what is a UC system. Hmm. Both fairly large. Stanford uh, has a very high tuition because it's a private school. Um, for California residents, the UC system was was a better bargain say, <laughs> for your education. <laughs> Bang for the buck. Yes. And um, it's just, it's a little bit different flavors, you know, as far as what is offered. And, of course, that depends on who is there teaching mm. and doing research. Mm. And UC Berkeley had a, a very fine um, past in, in chemistry. So it was, a, it, was a good, it was a good place to go to study chemistry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you, you finished your uh, studies here in Sweden to become a doctor. And you, you focused on the field of... Uh, Neurochemistry. Exactly. Yes, and neuroscience. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, because you have this, this field, uh, you know, the, your whole path, your whole research path, with the diseases of the mind, different uh, brain cancer and, and, uh, and uh, depression, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what, what have you learned about the mind and the brain? I think I've learned very little in relationship to how much we need to know. Yeah. Because the brain is um, somewhat of a last frontier in the human body. Uh, there's some wonderful large-scale projects going on and mapping the connectome, how nerves now are connected in the brain, which was largely unknown. Uh, but there's, there's still a lot of mystery. And so I think I picked it because not only is, I mean, the brain is us, our, our uh, mind is mm. in the brain, but it's, it's complex, it's not easy. And I felt like it was an important territory to explore in the field of brain diseases because brain diseases are usually devastating. Mm. Uh, we've come so much farther with other things, like with heart disease. We can transplant a heart in if your heart breaks, right? Mm. But we can't do that with the brain. So here we have to find ways to heal minds that are ill uh, and you know, help people live healthier and better lives and survive longer, and especially with the cancers of the brain, which are completely devastating. But usually um, the median survival and after your diagnosis of a malignant brain tumor is just 14 months. Yeah. So that means that 50% of the patients are expected to pass on in their disease within about a year. And you're working with that now? Yes. To find, find new cures and new ways to, to take back the things lost. Tell us about your research today. Yes, yeah, so in brain cancer, there have been very little uh, advances made in, in treatment that actually extend life or quality of life. And so I started to look at this problem with colleagues at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston uh, and other, other people that I needed on my team, bioinformaticians, for instance, um, genomic experts. And so the current treatment is uh, kind of a slash and burn type of treatment, which is not terribly specific in killing cancer cells. So... The, the, the standard treatment for a glioblastoma, which is the most malignant of the, the brain cancers, is uh, maximal safe surgery. Sometimes the, tr the tumor is in a part of the brain that you simply can't touch because then you might kill the patient or s take away their ability to speak or see. Uh, so that's the first step. And then uh, in context of the neurosurgery, uh, you're given radiation and a temozolomide, which is a chemotherapeutic. Uh, and that, uh, 
this system of treatment was devised many years ago, and it increased the survival, median survival from 12 months to 14 months. So we haven't been able to break the 14-month barrier. Mm. We need to get past that. And so uh, in my research, I look for uh, new targets, new protein targets as therapeutics, um, therapeutic targets for brain cancer. And how can that kind of make a revolution in the field, turning 14 months into 14 years? Yeah, so if we have some sort of specific pathway or protein that is aiding and abetting the brain cancer to survive by creating more energy for the tumor or creating small molecules that actually kill a normal brain, then we've got a smoking gun. This is what we want to treat, as well as with the standard uh, treatments, treatment regimen. But we can add on specific protein, uh, proteins to attack with, with either pharmaceuticals uh, in the form of small, small molecules or antibodies, and maybe you know, take down that tumor a little bit in, mm. its, uh, in its growth, uh, you may actually find something that kills it if, it, if it's a really a key protein. And so much of the studies that have been done on brain cancer have been on the standard human proteome. So the proteome is a, is a full complement of human proteins that are encoded by our genome. But all of our genes are not the same. There are a lot of gene variants and Typically, when uh, proteomic studies are done, they use the standard human genome. So you don't have all the features that might exist in pathological conditions like brain cancer. And so we did a big study on cancer stem cells that were low passage, and they were derived from brain tumors, clinical brain tumors at MD Anderson Cancer Center. They shared those materials with us. And we did a full proteome characterization using special databases that included uh, all protein variants. And lo and behold, we found the expression at the protein level of about 400 different proteins, okay, that hadn't, had never been detected before mm. at the protein level. And we thought, well, you know what? It would be uh, very likely to to find new proteins to drug in this group. But we had to figure out which ones because there could be bystander uh, changes that, you know, they have no, they're, they're there in the tumor, but they have nothing to do with the tumor pathology. So we had to find a way to stratify our data, and we've reported that now in, uh, in the scientific literature. But at the end of the day, with the help of a molecular epidemiologist and bioinformaticians, and a whole panel of expert, we, we came down to 10 protein variants that actually have a strong connection to um, decreased, decreased survival in glioma. And so we feel that these ones will be promising for future precision medicine. Is there anything we can do in order to prevent the, the, the diseases of the mind in our life? Well, the diseases of the mind are many, mm. so it depends on the disease. You have <laughs> Alzheimer, you have brain cancer, you have depression. Yes. Uh, is there something we can, like vaccination that we can do ourselves? Vaccination would be great. You just yeah. have to know what to vaccinate yeah. against. But is it like vaccinate with exercise and vaccinate with good food and, and, and that kind of stuff? Having a healthy lifestyle is is always a good thing. Mm. You know, it's it may not prevent brain cancer because we still don't know all of the causes of brain cancer. Mm. Very few of them are actually have a strong genetic, so family ties. Most of them are spontaneous, and we don't we don't really know why. There's a few things. Um, radiation is not good, for instance, but it's. It's so vague. It hasn't been coupled to, you know, big outbreaks of the flu or anything like that. So it's still rather mysterious why we get brain cancer. In fact, the question why in science is, the, is always the hardest one to mm. answer, in fact. Mm. 
But when it comes to mood disorders and um, to dementias, neurodegenerative diseases, of course, a healthy lifestyle is a good thing. And um, the things that are probably worse are uh, overconsumption of alcohol, obesity. Those can increase your risk of, of many of those types of diseases. Mm. Um, as we spoke of earlier today, uh, humans, you know, belong to the the primates, and also having a good social connection, just like apes and monkeys and chimpanzees live in large family units where you support each other. That can that can boost your energy and. Uh, I don't know if it can make you live longer, but it might be a happier life. Yeah. <laughs> we had a salad as lunch, so hopefully we're, <laughs> we're energetic the whole day. And your, your PhD, you, you have a long title here, mm. Analyst <laughs> with Mass Spec. Yes. It's the core business in your, yes. your studies. And you, you, you just kept on going. First you become a chemist, then you become a doctor, and then you become a doctor once more. Tell us about your thesis here. So my thesis work was done at Gothenburg University uh, under the tutelage of Rolf Ekman and Kai Blinov. And um, I just happened to be there one summer on a project and I met these two gentlemen and they were talking about their research. And I thought, wow, you know, Anything having to do with the brain is, is very difficult. That was right at the end of my medical education. Mm. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, what, what could be done about that? And, and Rolf Ekman showed me, well, look, look at this lab. We're going to get something in here called a mass spectrometer. And I was like, oh, I know what mass spectrometry is. And I'm like, gosh, could we really apply that to medical, you know, medical research? I had never considered that before, and I and I just you know started thinking that gosh we could make some really good sensitive analytics here and try to try to figure out the lay of the land in these mm. in these diseases so that we can get a better understanding and perhaps one day get better treatments. So I was very excited when I heard that. And you have a good mentor there. He's a, he's a bright guy. Both of them are very. Smart people, yes. We learn from smart people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As I've done today. He's uh, one of the leading researchers on, on Alzheimer's. Yes, Dr. Blenoff is, yes. He's a, he's a world-leading authority on that. And he has toiled tirelessly to find, you know, better di diagnostics mm -hmm. and um, works with a team, a clinical team also, that is working towards better treatments in dementias. So I hope by the time I get to be that age, we'll have something, <laughs> some good yeah. medicine and treatments. <laughs> yeah. And then you take the tour over the Atlantic once more to the other side, back to, but not, not the same side of the states. You go to Florida. Yes. Because they have this big guns there. Yes. Tell us about that. Uh, the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory in Tallahassee, Florida is one of three sites of the the national, national laboratories, along with Los Alamos and Gainesville. This is a um, NSF-funded, mainly an NSF-funded facility um, that costs hundreds of millions to run. There's a lot of scientists there. One section of the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory in Tallahassee is the Ion Cyclotron Resonance Program. And they have the best instruments in the world of these, what I mentioned yesterday, the superconducting magnet type of uh, You can't make it stronger analyzer. with the materials you have today. That's right. They commissioned a couple of years ago a 21 Tesla Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometer. And that is the strongest uh, mass analyzer in the world. It is uh, at the absolute limit of magnet technology now, including the superconducting materials of which the magnet is made. 
to make any stronger field, they will have to find new superconducting materials, and that's also a subject of research at that lab and mm -hmm. other labs around the around the com uh, country. So it's uh, you know it'd be very exciting to see if the superconducting field uh, comes up with new materials. One of these uh, technologies, you know, that changes everything, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll just have to see. But the right now we're things. yeah. It's a, and what did you do there? What did you learn? I learned an awful lot about physics mm -hmm. <laughs> and about how to apply physical measurements to various projects, mm -hmm. um, all kinds. So I had, you know, my own research interests, but we had um, we had a researcher coming from uh, India who had been looking at snail toxins that were they were not linear sequences; they were circular, and so we had to figure out a way to sequence the circular peptides in the gas phase and also look at uh, unusual amino acids and and post-translational modifications like sulfate and phosphate on them that was that was very challenging and really outside of my box but it's always exciting to deal with new things then you grow yes you do you, you have to stretch your stretch your thinker yeah up here yeah <laughs> and then you go into the private sector fights her on the other side of uh, America. Yes, that was in San Diego. I joined Pfizer on this trajectory of trying to find better treatments. Uh, what better way to learn how to to develop a treatment if not inside the walls of a pharmaceutical company? Because they're, they're not allowed to share freely of their art and science. And so the four years that I spent at Pfizer inside their walls gave me a lot of insight in just how you go about this mm. uh, of creating a new drug. Mm. And so now I carry that uh, knowledge with me as I move along in my own project. And you also got, got to know the limitations about Pfizer and, and, and the development of new drugs. Yes, uh, it's a commercial entity. So their uh, priorities are obviously different from the free, ac free, nothing's free, free-ish uh, mm. <laughs> academic environment. It's, uh, you know, they're, sometimes they're at odds. So um, they're, they, they need to develop drugs that will make money for the company. Uh, and so in, a, in an area such as brain cancer, which is not, as large of a therapeutic area as, say, cardiovascular disease or um, lung disease, then it means that some of these horrible diseases end up on sort of the orphan treatment list and is, it's not a priority for the company. Mm. So they shut down a lot of projects early on. Yes. Uh, there were constant changes in uh, what we should be doing as researchers at Pfizer coming from above, and I felt after a while that um, whatever I was doing was never going to come to any good in their customers, you know, because so much good research simply just disappeared, mm. couldn't, be pub couldn't be published and couldn't be used by the company. And for every billion dollars, it's going to be developed fewer and fewer new drugs. It's like a, the curve is going the wrong direction. Yes, it's very expensive to both um, produce new compounds and develop them to uh, um, a pill that you can, you know, prescribe. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a long trajectory, and so uh, with the patent time, it starts ticking from the time you put the patent on your compound. And with all this time that's lost, you have only a few years on patent to make back your money in the company. And that's one reason why new drugs are so expensive. Mm. So what some of the larger pharmaceutical companies are doing, they're buying up compounds that are already looking promising, and then they develop them instead of doing all of that long research part uh, inside their own walls. So if I put you in charge of Pfizer as CEO um, and your mission was to do it disruptive at <laughs> Uber and Airbnb, how would you change it? 
Well, I don't know that I'd want to be a CEO of a company. <laughs> you want to be a researcher as well, so I make you CEO and researcher. Yeah, now that's maybe the answer. Hmm. It wouldn't, might not be me, but maybe yeah. they need to have a good, you know, yeah. dedicated research person to make them the boss. Yeah. And maybe school in one of those, you know, with the, all the economic uh, education you need and leadership. Well, look, leadership there's in the research line as well. But that might be the best way is to pick a good scientist mm. in their lead. And, and there you... are many. There are very good scientists at Pfizer. I, had a, I mean, I had some very wonderful colleagues when I worked there. And then you have this limitation that you have to have one approval in, in Europe, one in Japan, and one in the U.S. with FDA. So it's kind of, it's not an easy way in any no, it's perspective not easy. at all. It is not easy. Uh, <laughs> Fraught with bureaucracy. Is there anything else we could do to, to you know, improve the hit rate of new drugs? Well, I think the uh, these integrated approaches where you look and in a cast a wide net, try to capture some features in the disease that look interesting and then start stratifying them with different types of analyses. So epidemiology is one, linking epidemiology to specific genes or, or proteins. That can make this whole process a lot easier. Mm. And then you go back to the academic life. You go to Galveston, Texas. Yes. An island in the, the Mexican Gulf, uh, tourist paradise. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about your, your journey back into the academic life. You become a professor, so you get them in the highest ranks, so to say. Yes, they offered me a professorship at um, the Department of Pharmacology and, to and Toxicology at the University of Texas Medical Branch. And um, my goal was to set up a lab that could serve analyses of these cancer stem cells from uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. from the neuro-oncology uh, neurosurgery team. And MD Anderson, that's a kind of world-class cancer medical facility. Yeah, it's a small city, in fact, that itself, that yeah. uh, is dedicated to making cancer history, yeah. as in history, by uh -huh. forever. So, and there's so many wonderful, dedicated clinicians there and clinician scientists. Uh, and they have biobanks that where patients have given consent to take samples from tumors. And, and then they have all the associated clinical metadata along with that patient. So there's a rich amount of information from the cancers that people have in the way of biochemistry. And so I set up my lab to try to understand what the biochemistry was and how it was linked to the disease. Mm. And what did you find? Well, this is what um, we talked about just a, a while ago. We focused mm. on the glioma cancer stem cells because these are thought to be very resistant to the standard of care treatment. Now, what I neglected to say was that the standard of care treatment most often results in a complete remission to begin with. And um, when you go back and you get your remission, then your brain is suddenly full of a very, usually a much angrier looking tumor than the original tumor. Mm -hmm. And it's thought that the glioma cancer stem cells are resistant to radiation, temozolomide. And they also cannot all be taken out with a knife because they're sort of invasive. They go into the normal brain and they hide there and the surgeon can't see them. So, uh, and there's been many studies on the cancer stem cells as well to, to show that that could very well be the case. So we looked at them as, uh, you know, a reservoir of tumors, uh, tumor cells that can create new tumors. Mm. And this is where we found these 400 variant proteins expressed in a panel of 36 uh, samples and where we in a rational manner stratified our data so that we could find 10 that look as though they as they may be promising as protein targets 
and uh, you lived both on the east coast, the west coast, and just in the middle in Texas. And the Gulf Coast. Yeah. Uh, what's the different aspects of living in America, California, Florida, Texas? Tell us about the nuances. Well, the USA is a very large place. And I would say that every place is different. So mm. Florida, I mean, just geographically, Florida, North Florida, I, I was very surprised by the nature in North Florida. There's, uh, there's so much life outside. There's so many birds. There are rivers. There are rivers that run straight out of the ground because they're springs. Mm. There are small snakes. There are big snakes. There's lots and lots of snakes and birds. <laughs> But in some way, uh, a lot of Florida is unspoiled. I mean, this nature, it's beautiful, but as I'm trying to tell you, there's, it may bite you back. You know, there's the snakes and the alligators and things. I've seen the alligators. <laughs> the, alligators <laughs> yeah. the alligators are actually shy. In South Florida, there's crocodiles, and that's a completely yeah. different matter. They'll come after you. Yeah. And mosquitoes will carry you away also in North Florida. And unfortunately, mosquitoes love me. Yeah. <laughs> so just the raw beauty in, of the nature in Florida, where it's still uh, largely unspoiled, is amazing. Mm. And then to have this huge technology hub having to do with, you know, magnet science there, it was, it's strange, I'll tell you that, mm. to have it in that kind of a place. But um, it was a great place to live. Mm. Uh, Florida, North Florida is great. Um California, yeah, San Diego. It's not like any other place. No, there's a lot of military facilities as well. There's a lot of military. The SEALs and... Yes, the, the Marines, the SEALs, the Air Force, the Army. It's all there, mm. <laughs> around there. Yeah. There's several bases. But at Pfizer, I mean, as an industry job, it, was, it had a, a California laid-back Feel to it because you know you drive down into the underground garage with your car in the morning, and here would be people who have been surfing before they go to work. And so there'd be wetsuits hanging down there yeah. and surfboards, and you don't see that just anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it in North Florida. No yeah. beaches close to there. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And in Texas, and well, in in Galveston, uh, it's very eclectic. You have the, the people who are born on the island, you know, the native people, if you want to call them that, <laughs> who are just, you know, laid back island people. And then there's lots and lots of tourists from time to time. And then there's the science and the medical education at the University of Texas. So uh, it, was a, it was a very nice place to, to do research and to work. Uh, we could just, when we were at the university, you know, we'd be focused on um, our research and education also of the medical students, which was very enriching. Uh, but when you walked off the campus, you were like in some kind of vacation paradise. Mm. <laughs> you managed to pick the, 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 the best spots yeah. of America. It wasn't random. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and today... You're back here in, in, in Skåne, in Lund. Yes. You got handpicked to become leader of the pack, researcher and professor. So you have kind of three titles here now. And there's a good environment here as well in the, in the scientific sense because we have uh, Max Lab. Yes. And we have uh, ESS. Tell us about this great tools for you in your work in the future to come. Yes, so it's not only um, for my work, but also for... Haven't they just built it for you? Oh, maybe they it? did. Yeah. I didn't get invited to the inauguration, <laughs> so I don't think so. <laughs> but yes, they'll be important tools for me, but they'll be important for the region, for Sweden, and really... Uh, when it comes to to Max4 and ESS, these are world labs. These mm. are places where uh, researchers from all over the world will come to do measurements. 
sim and I'm, you know, Max 4 is simply the best, it's the brightest light in the world now for, for doing structural studies of various things, not just proteins. Mm. Uh, and as you mentioned, <clears throat> I was named director of the Swedish National Infrastructure and Biological Mass Spectrometry. And this was funded by uh, the Swedish Science Council, Vetenskops wrote it, and it's co-financed by uh, the participating universities. So Lund is the hosting node for this infrastructure, but there are nodes also in Stockholm at Karolinska Institute and in uh, Gothenburg at uh, Gothenburg University and Chalmers Institute of Technology. Uh, so this is really exciting because now Sweden has a national resource. It's not just one lab, like mm. the very large structure labs that we have in Lund. But this, this will serve all of Sweden, and we do accept proposals also from outside our borders. But this is very high-level analytical um, infrastructure so that we can help researchers with a specific biological question to devise the right uh, analysis of their samples and to give them data that will be published in high quality journals so it's not just a it's not a core facility if hmm. uh, you know what that is this is really a research hub hmm. by OMS we want to become best in class hopefully you're almost there <laughs> <laughs> You're almost there, but I see the national infrastructure in biological mass spectrometry is very complementary to Max4 and ESS. And in the future, we're going to be building out our structural mass spectrometry so that we can help um, in, uh, investigators that come to the synchrotron uh, with their you know, crystal analysis. We can do the the gas phase analysis, and we can do it in several different ways to give them complementary data sets. Mm. So I think the future of this kind of science in the Lund region is is really strong. It's kind of a trinity. Yeah. Between, and you're living exactly. on a ranch outside of Lund. Yes. With your daughter and newly born grandchild. Yes, it's wonderful. It's, it's a wonderful a, place to be. And you harvest your food and. Yeah, the beautiful nature out there. Yeah. Uh, the fields and the uh, there's uh, preserves of forests, old forests, beach forests out there, all kinds of wildlife. But it's uh, very quiet, so it's not wildlife, but there's wildlife. Yeah. You know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a great place to be. Quiet wildlife. <laughs> and what would your three best advices for for you know young people today who want to become researcher, uh, what would you tell them? Just do it. Mm. There's, if there's, like you feel if, if, you, if you feel, uh, you know, uh, if you're towards that inclination, then you just need to do it. You need to find good mentors and, you know, follow whatever subject it is that you're passionate about. Maybe, so we've, we've had... Um, some project workers out on our ranch studying bumblebees. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to understand how we can increase the number of bumblebees because bees and bumblebees of all types are unfortunately negatively impacted by, by big agriculture. Yeah. And so they were going around near the fields and uh, looking at bumblebee DNA to see, looking for the diversity, basically, in the yeah. bumblebee population out where I live. Um, and so they're, they were they were impressed with our garden because we planted flowers out where we're growing vegetables and other things. And they're like, "Oh, wow, you guys have a lot of bumblebees." And we're like, "Oh, <laughs> yes, we're doing something yeah. right. Go bumblebees!" <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful name, bumblebee. <laughs> yeah. What you know? What, what defines a good researcher? Well, uh, someone who's driven. If if you don't have drive. And don't have focus. It's hard to get to end results that are meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you have to. A lot of research requires time, and a lot of energy. Um, it can nowadays, when you go to the literature to learn more about your area, the literature is very large now. It's a lot larger than when I started out, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it just keeps growing. 
So there's, um, there's a lot of study involved, or can be. And, and, and the difference between a good researcher and a Nobel Prize coming winner, what do you think? That, that leap to the, the world-class elite, what defines that? Genius. Genius. In a word. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you don't know you're a genius. And can you develop <laughs> so. that gene or is it just born with it? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I think um, genius is, is something you may be born with, but I think you can increase your odds by looking outside the box. Not only, not only looking at the very little area that you're studying, but maybe enjoying the arts. Maybe you can get some inspiration. There's some sort of crossover between you know, the programs that are going on your head and say, wait a minute, what if we do like this? That's mm. genius. Mm. I think thinking. that's how it's done. Yeah. I wish I was better at it. <laughs> and do you see any differences between American scientists and Swedish scientists? You know, when we get together um, in international meetings, on these various topics, we're kind of cut out of the same mold. Mm. So it really doesn't matter where you're from. Mm. And here in Lund, you're mixing, just in your corridor here, you're mixing like 20 countries or something. Mm -hmm. That's very enriching. Yeah. To have different, if they're all Brazil young people, of course. Brazil and Japan and <laughs> yeah. coming from everywhere. Yes. So they have different backgrounds, they have a different point of view, and all of that is extremely valuable in a research environment. Yeah, it's beautiful. So, warm thank you for letting me share your day. Thank you. A great day and the best of luck. All right, with, thanks. With important research. Luck is, a, is another important component to yeah. research. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks. Well, thanks.